everyone. Um, I hope I'm not speaking too loud, but thank you so much for joining us today as uh, we talk about Ford's journey from ClickOps to GitOps. So basically, zero GitOps to a whole lot of GitOps. And um, I am Jalam. I work at Red Hat, and I am in the OpenShift team, in the OpenShift product marketing team. And I'm super excited to talk to you all and talk about Ford. And I have Arthur with me, who can introduce himself. I'm Arthur. I work at Ford. I'm on the platform engineering team that handles the configuration and deployment of OpenShift and Kubernetes. And at Ford, we obviously build vehicles. But with those vehicles, they are now more connected than ever. So those tele telemetry vehicles, our system build vehicles, our other sub-organizations like Ford Credit, our banking divisions all require uh, these services, and they're moving from legacy VMs and applications to more modern container-based solutions. So the rise of Kubernetes at Ford is prominent. And Red Hat, if you didn't have a chance to stop by our booth outside, we're an enterprise open source company. Uh, OpenShift is our hybrid cloud application platform, and we're excited to talk about how Ford has been using OpenShift and GitOps. And I'll hand it back to Arthur now. Thank you. So Ford started their journey into Kubernetes back in 2017 with CoreOS and Tectonic. Uh, later, when it was acquired, we switched over to OpenShift, and then uh, around May 2020, we started to become more production ready with OpenShift. And learning the hard way, we figured that we needed to switch our permission model to a more uh, least privilege. Previously, the entire team had cluster admin, access to all the secrets, et cetera, et cetera. This led to some disastrous effects. So we switched to more least privilege model with a subset of the team having access as well as granting increased access on an as needed basis. Later that same year, we switched over to using Customize to manage our YAML manifest. Previously, we were using uh, shell scripts to manage the configuration of different versions of our YAMLs, and that ended up becoming extremely complicated. At that time, we were also only managing two monolithic clusters, so we had a non-production and production, which contained all of our workload of various differing uh, performance characteristics. So in uh, 2021, we started to break down those two monolithic clusters into purpose-built clusters where we split off our CI-CD to their own clusters, for example, one for Jenkins, one for Tecton. And we had shared clusters for general purpose workloads as well as dedicated clusters for uh, GPU-based workloads or any other custom workload that we decided would be better to have separated from everyone else. And then starting in KubeCon last year, we started the process of joining or starting to use Argo CD. Because as we split off those clusters, now we have a whole bunch of permutations of YAMLs that we need to keep track of and deploy. So we started to refactor our customized overlays to be more multi-cluster oriented, and then integrating with Argo CD to manage the reconciliation of those YAMLs onto the cluster. Where we sit now is basically everything is managed through Argo CD. There may be a YAML or two that's missing, but essentially everything is done through Argo CD. And then next year, we plan to also launch Argo CD as a service to our application teams so they can use Argo CD to manage their application lifecycle on OpenShift as well. Our current fleet size is about 50 clusters with 2,000 application teams split across about 8,500 namespaces. They're prod, they're non-prod, they're CI/CD namespaces, and so on. And with OpenShift 414 around the corner, we have to essentially rebuild every cluster. So we'll be immediately doubling our footprint as we migrate people from one cluster to the new cluster. And with the decommission of other legacy applications or legacy platforms that our applications are hosted on, we'll be increasing the footprint size due to that as well. So we should be seeing a two to three X growth probably in the next one to two years in terms of our footprint size. And some of the challenges we had before we introduced Argo CD were that um, configuration drift. We have a whole bunch of clusters to keep track of. And we still put our code in YAML, or our YAML in GitHub. But even then, there are still humans in between the code and the cluster. So sometimes you miss something. Sometimes you're not paying attention. or 
you're on the wrong cluster to begin with, and some, that's disastrous. <laughs> so as we learn to be more careful, Argo CD just ended up being inevitable. And why do we use Argo CD over, let's say, another product is their plugin mechanism is very extensible and very helpful. Because Argo CD out of the box takes your YAML and applies it to the cluster. But there are cases where you want maybe more checks in place in between the YAML and the cluster. So using the CMP plugins, we're able to extend Argo CD to do those custom checks that we want. Uh, the metrics that Argo CD exposes up into the open shift is also useful for tracking purposes. And then we aggregate those across all our clusters into one place so we can see across the fleet what Argo is doing. And that's actually a good example of this was a couple weeks ago, the container registries for Red Hat went down. And we had an upgrade going on around at the same time. And essentially everything was failing everywhere at the same time because nothing could pull images. So we were able to catch that, or at least we were able to see it, which was nice. We couldn't do anything about it, but uh, so. The differential YAML viewer is also nice. Uh, we have a lot of stuff auto-syncing, but not everything. So with the YAML viewer, we're able to see the deltas, particularly when we were enrolling old clusters into Argo CD. It was very helpful to see what was missed in the past. Because we had made configurations, but you didn't know what the configurations of the clusters were until you installed Argo and compared all the deltas. So some of the plugins we're currently doing today are uh, secrets management, so we're using the Argo CD Vault plugin to pull secrets from Secret Manager. That way our YAMLs only have references to secrets and not the secrets themselves in GitHub. And then we have uh, two other plugins for pulling information from the cluster directly, the infrastructure ID and the unique identifier for the cluster. Those are not known ahead of time of cluster build, particularly with uh, IPI installs. So those are generated dynamically, so our YAMLs can't contain that in GitHub. And then the last plugin is just a simple framework for testing the YAMLs. So, and we'll get into more of that a little bit later. So, like I said, basically everything is managed through Argo CD. And then at about this present time, we're sitting at about 60% of our configurations, just auto sync from GitHub to the cluster. We are also looking at doing more sync waves, not sync wave, uh, uh, is it? Time window, the time window feature of Argo CD. I blank on the actual term. But trying to get that more oriented so we can time box certain clusters to certain time windows. And at least we can get those merged in GitHub sooner instead of it being instantaneous. Uh, in the last 40%, we're, as we get more comfortable with how we process our Git PRs and how Argo does its syncing, we'll continue to increase. Some of the major ones that we are still skim skipping out on are uh, upgrades so we don't auto sync from GitHub just in case something were to downgrade. We don't want that to happen, particularly for the cluster. But we continue to increase that, and we will do more of that. So since Argo applies YAMLs to the cluster, we want to make sure those YAMLs that are in GitHub are as clean as possible. So each overlay from Customize has a test script in there, and in that test script, the logic varies all the way from just running a customized build to pulling in the secrets to even checking the contents of those YAMLs. So if I want to go to cluster A and I want, there's other references to that cluster A in the YAMLs, I want to make sure that that folder that that cluster is in matches all the con content items within it. Particularly one that's pretty important is the one overlay that manages the cluster certificates. So we don't have cert manager on our clusters due to some internal business requirements. So up until then, we're storing our certificates in a secrets tool, and we're pulling those in dynamically through Argo CD. But we don't want Argo CD to apply the wrong certs to the cluster, or even expired certs to the cluster, or if for some reason someone deleted the certs from the secret manager. So that test that runs on the PR, and that same test file that runs through the plugin to the cluster checks, is this cert for the right cluster? Is it expired? Does it have all the intermediary chains? Does the key even match the cert itself? So we're doing, running all those checks beforehand. And we're also using kubeconform to check the YAML spec of the YAMLs as our linting mechanism as well. And for items like the OpenShift upgrades, 
we have to include both the version of OpenShift and the SHA, and then based off that Cincinnati graph that Red Hat publishes, we're able to confirm that, hey, there's no typos. This, this shot for this image, it matches this tag that is being used to upgrade the cluster. Uh, some other features we want to add to that one in particular is making sure the upgrade paths are supported as well in our PRs. So if, you're, if the kit says you're at this version and you want to go to the next version, pulling that upgrade path information as well. So we're not upgrading from one version to another. Because when you go through, when you apply the YAML directly, it skips the cluster checks by default. So whatever version you put in, the cluster will just happily accept. <clears throat> so since we're using Customize to upgrade our overlays, we wanted to make sure that when we refactored them, we structured our overlays in such a way that we're not duplicating a whole bunch of code, but we also don't have code that if we do change, won't necessarily cause an unexpected change to the entire fleet. So we kind of went with a structure that where base contains stuff that will be fairly static and pretty consistent across the fleet. So like your namespace YAML is essentially going to be the same for every cluster and it probably won't change. Uh, certain RBAC values, we have a custom job for approving operators on the cluster. And then our components, we have optional fields that are for each cluster. So in the context of Argo CD, the applications that are applied to a cluster vary. So those we threw under components. And then under, we have a version subfolder under components, which contains all the different versions of um, Argo CD and all its associated YAMLs that change between the versions, generally CRD changes. And then overlays are point to the combination of all of those previous subfolders and any custom patches that need to be done on a per environment basis. And then there's that test file we were talking about that will test the specific values. And then this is kind of some of the open source tooling that we use on to kind of manage everything. Uh, Argo CD, obviously. We use Helm very sparingly. The main benefit that I found Helm for is when you need to do nested arrays. Trying to do nested arrays with customize is a mess. So for managing machine sets and storage classes, Particularly, we're using Helm, and for everything else, we're using Customize. And then we use Kyverno as well in our pipelines to do policy checking, as well as we're starting to roll that out on our clusters as well. That way, we can check in the PR, and then we can check in the cluster. Then we use Argo CD Vault Plugin for our secrets replacement. Customize is our YAML management of choice. Cube Builder is what we've been using to build uh, operators, custom operators. Uh, we also are starting to look at the operator SDK as well. And then Cube Conform is what we use for uh, spec checking. We pull those values in from the cluster, throw them in a repo, and are able to reference them. Uh, Pipeline as code and Tekton is our CI CD that handles all of our PR checks and then open cluster management for our observability. And then the clusters live in GCP, so confer configuring all of our GCP resources are done through Terraform. So not everything on OpenShift presently is very GitOps friendly. But with these plugins and our custom operators, we can make it become more GitOps friendly. So with the monitoring stack as an example, OpenShift configures it through a large YAML and YAML. And when you're trying to manage many permutations of this, it becomes very complicated. You, so what we did is we essentially wrote an operator that contains a CRD of the configuration of this YAML and YAML. So all the operator does is convert the CRD into a config map. It's really straightforward. But what this lettuce does is use customize to patch the different pieces of this CRD instead of trying to mangle a YAML that's inside of a YAML. Similarly, before, the UID gets injected on that replace me line by the CMP plugin because that gets passed in to the open cluster management to identify the cluster. Um, and another tidbit, if you didn't know, the UID of the cluster is m not immutable, so you can lose it. So that we have to back up as well beforehand, just in case. The next step forward for us is managing our tenant namespaces for our application teams through Argo CD. Right now, we have custom APIs that manage our namespaces, and they interact directly with the cluster. So we want to migrate those to Argo CD as well, which means we need to first put those in GitHub. So we need to retroactively dump everything. And then we need to reconfigure all of our onboarding APIs to point to Git first. So similarly, 
the pipelines we have for configuring the cluster will also be used for configuring uh, namespace tenants. But we have additional policy checks for different business rules because we need certain annotations on the namespaces. We need certain permission structures. We want to make sure people aren't throwing in extra YAMLs that they may or may not need. So as long as the business rules pass, if people want to write their own operator, or not operators, their own APIs for interacting with our clusters, they can. As long as it goes through Git, we're good to go. Uh, one check that we don't have in our pipelines at the moment that will be challenging is how to account for resource quota increases. Because people like to increase their quotas, but they don't necessarily understand how much they need to use. And I'm going to pass it back over to Jalen to talk about the next couple slides. Thanks, Arthur, for walking us through for its journey. Um, and no journey that spans so many applications, so many teams, so many clusters could be done without challenges. So let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that they face and what they're planning on doing next. So some of the bigger challenges that Ford has come across has uh, They've arrived, they've arose um, because they've started to scale so much, uh, namely the experience of using Argo across multiple clusters and multiple instances is not uh, very pleasant, and they are a bit intertwined with each other. The problem is that when you have more than one instance of Argo CD on a cluster and you try to look at the status of your applications, you have to go into each individual Argo instance to see the CD, uh, to see the status of the app. There is no centralized place as such to see the status of all of your applications. You could be using one Argo instance to manage other Argo instances, but that also only does so much. You can only see uh, information on the configuration of um, the clusters and not the status of the apps themselves. So we do have a little bit of an observability problem, especially at scale on our hands here. And this also makes isolation harder since the multi-tenancy is insufficient and it's just not good security practice. And at Red Hat, we've seen this problem come up with a lot of our customers, not just Ford. So anyone who is expanding their Argo usage to use more than one instance or more than one cluster is going to have this problem. And, and so as the Argo community, we have a really good opportunity on our hands to um, provide solutions to this as the Argo usage grows and larger organizations and teams start to use it at a bigger scale. Uh, the next few problems that Ford has faced are a little bit more platform, so OpenShift specific. OLM, or Operator Lifecycle Manager, uh, cannot roll back or roll forward. Uh, so if you use Argo to manage operators, which is the main, use, uh, main reason to use Argo to manage operators is to allow them to roll forward, OLM doesn't allow to do that. Uh, some of our OpenShift components, like Arthur mentioned, uses uh, YAML and YAML, which we all know how much fun that can be. It's just not uh, easy to manage. It's, it's a little bit of a pain, uh, and we don't want to do that. And finally, when Ford upgrades clusters, things always they don't go very smoothly. It sometimes results in improperly configured PDPs for their app teams. Nodes get stuck. Applications uh, do not terminate properly. And OpenShift has a couple of operators uh, that might help solve this issue. So Ford will be um, looking into that into the future. Um, and these are just some of the boundaries that Ford has drawn into as they use Argo at scale. Um, and as larger organizations start using Argo, we're starting to learn more about these challenges. We're starting to uncover what happens uh, when Argo is used at such a scale. And we see this with other customers as well. And we're working on fixing it. But these are problems that if we come together as a community to solve, it would be um, really helpful and we can figure out how to get Argo past these boundaries. Uh, finally, let's talk a little bit about what's next for Ford. Uh, what are the future enhancements and how we're going to help uh, Ford do more with Argo as well. So Ford wants uh, to use progressive delivery uh, using Argo rollouts. Arthur's team is looking at rollouts for their developer team uh, so that the devs won't have to worry about Argo instances as much. On Red Hat's side, um, a lot of our customers are also looking at rollouts, um, and they're already starting to use it as well. So we've started contributing to uh, the rollouts community, and we look forward to getting more and more involved in the community as we work with our customers even more. 
Ford is also interested in the Argo image updater, and they're looking at it specifically for uh, deployments. Uh, this is something that they've been waiting uh, on the upstream community for, and they're hoping that they can start exploring it soon. With multi-cluster auth, they're um, interested in seeing how they can use, uh, how they can have Argo CD communicate with other OpenShift or Kubernetes clusters without using tokens. And like Arthur mentioned, they're interested in uh, the secret store uh, CSI driver for secrets management. They want to have the lowest touch uh, secrets management system, and we're helping them as they explore this as well. The plugin system in Argo um, wasn't created with multi-tenancy in mind. So if folks have multiple teams in a single instance who shouldn't be sharing information, like Ford or a lot of other big organizations would, uh, the certificates or secrets should not be stored on the cluster itself and you'd probably be better off using something like an external secrets operator or a secret store CSI driver. Um, and it basically is a secrets management tool that acts as a go-between, so it fetches uh, secret data from the vault and makes it available to the container. And this, is, uh, this has just been made tech preview with OpenShift 414, and it already works with Argo CD, so it doesn't need anything special to be added to it. And the scalability sec, like finally. Uh, this group has been very collaborative and exciting. It's been a really great opportunity. The Red Hat GitOps engineering team has been really heavily involved, and we are very excited to uh, just work more on testing and finding root causes for scalability issues that the customers and community run into. And Fort tends to push boundaries a lot with their use of open source projects, which is really cool. And I hope that they're some of the first ones who test um, the work that comes out of um, the scalability SIG. Finally, Argo as a service. Arthur's team uh, would like to explore and run Argo CD as a service for their app dev teams. Arthur mostly spoke about what they've done uh, managing their configuration and infrastructure with Argo CD. So helping their dev teams with, uh, with this would be a new area. And they do want to give their teams as much flexibility as they need. Uh, so if a team wants to manage their own instance and they want more control, they can have it. Uh, versus if they want uh, to be more hands-off, Arthur's team can help uh, sort of help with that as well. And Red Hat and Ford are working together to help them be successful with this. We see a lot of other larger organizations uh, use this method. So we're learning from the ones who've been successful and trying to help Ford as well. And I think that's it. It's time for questions and feedback. Please let us know if you've run into these similar challenges and how you've solved them. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Hi. An approach we've taken for controlling for uh, configuration drift and approaching upgrades is repaving, enforcing repaving, forcing instances to be deleted and then reinstantiated from the freshest spec. So you spoke to the challenges of keeping some of the components of the platform up to date. How do you manage that? How do you manage upgrading Kubernetes, nodes, and the software that isn't so easy to update autosync with Argo CD? How do you manage that? Um, so as far as, I guess you're saying you rebuild the clusters to do upgrades? That's what the approach that we've taken, because it's hard otherwise to our, get reliable our results. Our developer base would be very hesitant to that model. Uh, they are not quick to migrate. So we have to make sure we're able to do everything in place. And overall, from a OpenShift perspective, we haven't had too many issues with uh, from the cluster perspective, we've had pretty much no issues with doing upgrades in place. When we run into issues is generally with app teams, and um, that hasn't been really, really an issue. We're able to do in-place upgrades pretty frequently. It's just a matter of we have to basically force terminate stuff. Stuff gets stuck, and we just have to force terminate it. But we've never, we've very rarely ran into a case where we have to uh, reinstantiate an entire instance due to some bug or something. Thank you. Hey, I have a question. Um, part of the list of uh, softwares you guys are using and um, with the help of Red Hat is OCM, correct? Yeah. Okay, so um, with OCM, what would be the uh, main difference with OCM and Cluster API? Hey, I'm not too familiar with Cluster API. Do what? I'm not too familiar with Cluster so API. So Cluster API, again, is an open source project 
I think, that came from VMware and Tanzu to control and maintain um, your set of clusters. Um, basically, it's part of the, I think it's part of the Kubernetes projects on CNCF, and um, it's for, uh, you know, it's the same thing, like has a uh, central hub and, um, you know, brings up and maintains clusters gotcha. there. So we have these two open source projects. I'm really curious if you guys would I kind hadn't of answer the I question. I had to look into the other one. <laughs> okay. I'll have to take a peek at it and see right, what, cool. what it offers. Got it. All right, I think thank that's you.